Hi, my name is Nick Gibson, the creator of Turn Samurai and Screecher. Check out the link to your below, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined by a very busy but very talented individual. He is the creator of 2100 Samurai, which I think is an awesome name in itself, but also the creator of Screecher, which has a campaign currently ongoing. We are joined today by the ever-talented Nick Gibson. How are you doing today? Ah, I'm kind of on cloud rut nine right now. Uh, as we are recording this, I literally just got back from a con like not even half an hour ago. I'm a little bit bushwhacked, but I got some uh, really good uh, Mexican burritos in my stomach now, so I'm kind of feeling a little bit better. Nice. Um, you know, yeah, I'm growing and ready to go. <laughs> For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, my name is Nick Gibson, and I am a... Uh, Millionaire, Playboy, Thrampus. Oh, wait, that's Tony Stark. I'm not sure. So, my name is Nick Gibson. I'm a uh, creative soul, and I'm most well known for the comic book Dark Samurai. And hopefully, in a few months' time, I'll be known for the comic book Screecher. Uh, I'm a big sci fi nerd, love my video games. And honestly, I just, I just love to have fun. So, what was the comic uh, convention that you were at uh, this weekend? It was a local convention. It was called the Monroe Pop Fest here in Michigan. How did you do? Really fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be doing a convention this February in like Warren, which is actually really close to Detroit. Okay. So, so yeah, I, like that, that one you can come to if you want. Talk about this local convention. Why is it important for you to not only have a presence there, but also to showcase your, your wares? My comic's not going to sell itself first and foremost. While I do, while online is important, I really feel like it's really good to kind of get out of your online bubble, online sphere. And just interact with normal people. Life is not Twitter. Life is not Facebook. Life is not YouTube. Life is life. It's really important to show your comic to people and see how the average comic book fan. Sure, there's lots of people on Twitter, but there's millions of people in real life who have never had Twitter and probably will never have Twitter, you know, or any other social media. I feel like it's really important to, to market yourself, not just to online people, but also in real life. And to that end, comic cons are really important. They're the one time where you have people that they're not only a captive audience, but they're an active audience. If you go to a comic con, odds are you're probably a fan of comics, or you're just there to see, uh, you know, a celebrity. And if you're kind of walking through Artist Alley, you're probably disposed to look at comics and probably spend. It's like a really great market if you know what to do. So then, talk about some of your comics here that you've created. Let's let's talk about Twenty One Hundred Samurai. What's the what's the pitch for Twenty One Hundred Samurai? So the the spiel that I probably did about thirty times <laughs> today goes about as thus. So Turn Samurai is basically a cyberpunk samurai tale. You have a man from feudal Japan gets transported to the cyberpunk future of Twenty One Hundred, left on the mean streets of New Detroit. He's now got to fend for himself, and you know, blah 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 blah. <laughs> Sometimes I get so like bored with saying the same pitch over and over again. I try to, like, vary it up a little bit. Like, I try to tell it in different ways. It's, like, it's kind of a twofold thing. Like, one, I get bored saying the same thing over and over again. Two, I feel like I kind of owe it to my customers not to just, you know, keep saying the same pitch. It just makes, you know, makes it more interesting, I guess. So then, with, of course, this convention, it's great that because of COVID, we, we had limited access to comic conventions. We had limited access to people in general. How was this weekend so far in terms of not only sales, but maybe in terms of the presence of, of the people looking at your, your, your amazing work. Oh, uh, there was a pretty, pretty healthy people. I've been doing cons since about 2018. So like, I kind of know what cons were like before and how things kind of started to trickle back. Like obviously in 2020, everything was shut down. In 2021, I started kind of started doing cons again, kind of like at the back half. And there were some people, things are kind of getting more, kind of more back to normal. You know, we've kind of lifted most of our mask restrictions, but like even then you still see, you know, people here and there kind of wearing masks. That's kind of how it is. Sales wise though, from I from a brief tweet I saw you, it seems like you did okay. Uh, I think that'd be uh fair to a bit of a gross understatement. <laughs> 
it's, it's got to be great to see the fans coming to not only because of your pitch, but because of your your comic as well too. Because twenty one hundred Samurai is, is beautifully drawn from the art that I I have been able to see. I haven't gotten to read it unfortunately yet. Time restrictions more than anything, but I think it was it's a great concept and, and some amazing art as well too. I'm just the uh, the writer okay. and the team leader. Like yeah. I, I kind of like guide the ship and and whatnot, and then I also do some graphic design work for the comics. Like I designed the covers, yeah. not necessarily the cover art. And then I also designed like the credit pages and whatnot. I get to have, like the credits pages are which, when I get to get to have a little bit of fun. Like, so for Torn Samurai issue one, I did an homage to the Commodore 64. Nice. Welcome screen. Like, it, like if you look at it and you know Commodore 64, like, yeah, it's pretty obvious. And then for issue two, I did an homage to the Apple II. With that one was a little bit more on the nose because like I just did like a bezel. And then I kind of put like green, green kind of text and whatnot. It's just fun for me. Oh, yeah. And plus, like, you know, Torn Samurai, there's kind of like a retro kind of feel to it. Because like story-wise, electronics aren't being made anymore. So like, he is 2100, but you got people still using like Commodore 64, Apple IIs. Mm-hmm. And then it, but, and stuff like iPads and like iPhones are like a high luxury items. All the rare earth metals that make electronics ran out. So it's like people are just trying to keep what's still around alive, you know. That's just kind of my narrative excuse to have it be 2100 to have people still using Commodore 64. Because like, I kind of wanted to evoke that like 80s cyberpunk feel, you know, where like you're watching like uh, an old Shadowrun advertisement and they're using a cyber deck where it's like an old old Apple computer. I just kind of wanted to evoke that version of cyberpunk where it's like, you know, the old old computer. You played cyberpunk 2077, right? Yes, uh, I, I actually currently install it like, on this very PC. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I have it on mine too. I haven't played in a couple of, uh, in about a year and a half or so. You really um, should. There's been a lot of, it was just released a big update. That's what I saw. Yeah, because I wanted to watch the anime as well from Netflix to, to play it just to kind of get a, a basis. But I think oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go back I need and, to check that out. It's, it's really good from, from what I've seen. Who is the team that actually worked with you on, on 2100 Samurai? Because we have to promote the people working with you. The team did shift between issues one and two and I slightly tweak for uh, issue three so issue one was done by obviously i'm the writer for all this so i keep that in mind and then the pencils and inks the first 17 pages of issue one were done by a woman named miyasaki but around page 17 she had to drop out for personal reasons it is what it is you know no hard feelings and so i hired an artist called brian q i mean he's, he's a south american artist it's like brian groger so i just call it brian q and it's just you know be short brian q finished the last few pages of, of issue one and then it was lettered by a woman named nikki powers now that name will show up again by the way oh also the cover for issue one was done by an artist named uh, nick garvin you know, going to issue two uh i was lucky to have a cover made by arvel jones who was a former marvel artist Really great guy. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I got to see him today at the con. You know, I actually took a picture of him. He was holding the comic, you know, the, the cover he wrote for me. It was it was great. Nice. Brian Q did the interiors for it. And Brian Q actually did the letters for this one. It's basically just me and Brian are really the, the two there. So that, that's the uh, the creative team for Torn Samurai. Now that we've covered 2100 Samurai, let's talk about Screecher, which is your newest comic out, which I've gotten to actually look at the artwork for and and kind of peruse the comic that way i would have loved to have seen some dialogue with it as well too but i'll take what i can get for that matter tell us the the premise of screecher and uh, why was this story important for you to create well as far as the importance part of it a lot of it was kind of born for kind of going back to the cons current samurai obviously is a mature rated book it's kind of like a light r mm-hmm. kind of thing like there's curse words there's violence i don't really do nudity i, I want this to be Mature audience, but not explicit. I didn't want to create like a, a porno comic. So I, I, I kind of had a lie. So I had a lot of people tell me like, hey, we like your comic, but we're buying for our kid and we can't buy this comic for him because it literally says mature audience is only on the comic. And I get that. I totally get that. I respect a parent's right to choose what's for their kids. I wanted to create a comic that's more all ages, like the same kind of con- level of content you'd see in your standard Marvel or DC comic. So like a 13 plus kind of, Turn Samurai is 17 plus. This one is more like 13, 12, 13 plus. That kind of was uh, where I kind of started from. And to do that, I kind of reached into my childhood. Like I kind of combined uh, two different things. So my prime comic reading, late 90s, early 2000s, that's kind of my era. I read a lot of the Chuck Dixon era, Nightwing, a lot of Batman comics of that era. Young Justice. The only really Marvel stuff I read was like Ultimate X-Men and Ultimate Spider-Man. Kind of wanted to bring that back. 
evoke that era of comics, particularly the Batman stuff. I created kind of Screecher from there. I love Batman. I kind of wanted my own version of it, kind of wanted to put my own spin on it. And so I created it from there. And then, like, costume-wise, it's like a combination of, like, Batman, Moon Knight, and then I literally ripped the, the cape off of Dove from Titans and put it on my girl Screecher. <laughs> so Screecher is about a woman named Avery Slexner. Seven years prior to the start of the story, her dad was arrested for a crime he did not commit because her father committed the sin of having a heart. Harrison Fletcher was part of the biotech division of Eden Pharmaceuticals. He was developing a formula for an unlimited energy source, and the company wanted to turn it into a weapon. So he destroyed it to where the formula basically was in his head. So as a means to try and get it from him, they invented a bezelman charge. So they arrested him, and then seven years later, Avery Fletcher, who is now 19 years old and has been living in New York with her mother the past seven years, is forced to come back to Ann Arbor, Michigan. They send her a letter saying, tell us what we want to know, we'll probably kill. Maybe Avery goes to your father in jail, tries to convince him. He gives her like a code word, so she goes back to her house in Dexter, Michigan, meets up with Scotty, who is the caretaker of the property, who's basically uh, a second father, the Alfred, if you will. Gives her the code word and takes Avery down to like this cave. Now veils a superhero suit. Basically, the backstory is the mother, who's an engineering professor, basically ran the U of M engineering department. They made Harrison a real life superhero suit back in 2005 as a uh, birthday present. I mean, that's the story. Truth may be different, but like that's just what you hear in the first issue. So she modifies it for herself, and then you know she takes on the mantle of scripture in order to try and see justice done for her father. So who's the creative team then, since you're the, you're the writer for this, as you previously mentioned, who's the, who's the team behind this uh, comic? So there's a few familiar uh, returning faces for this one. So like, I'm the writer. Brian Q is on penciling and inking duties for colors. And this uh, so creature will be in color, by the way. I'm working with an Italian artist named Gomanji. He did an amazing job. There was kind of a style that I was trying to evoke. That dude nailed it. Like, nailed it like a pro he is. And then for letters, Nikki Powers is actually returning. She worked on issue one for Samurai, and now she's going to be working on Street. And I'll be having a cover done by Zevious, which I haven't gotten back yet, but it's it's uh, due here in the next few weeks. So then what was the scene where you wrote in, I, in both 2100 Samurai and Screecher, when you got the art back, it just blew what you had in mind out of the water? Probably what comes to mind first is there's a kind of a scene from Screecher kind of towards the end where, like, she's trying to escape. Some stuff happens, and, like, she kind of crashes through a window. And when I got it back, I, it just it just came out so well. It came out so well. It just looks beautiful. Then there's a, another one in Screecher where she's riding out on her motorcycle, and it's like, you know, it's one of those things where it's like you got the caption boxes, kind of like a narration kind of thing. It's honestly my favorite page. Um, in the whole book, that's page 14, by the way. Just so beautiful. It's like kind of like a time lapse where like it starts out light and then like it gets progressively darker, and, you know, setting sun. And then like, like there's a shot of her on a hill. You see the buildings, like the lights are glowing. It just looks so amazing. When I got that, pulled that panel back from the colors, it was at that moment that I realized, holy shit, I think I might have something special here. You know, when you tell someone that you're a, a writer, or a comic writer for that matter, what is the most misunderstood aspect people have of that profession that maybe they don't understand since they're not in that industry? Uh, like a foundational lack of understanding. They don't really understand the time. And being a writer is honestly wearing so many hats. It's more than just arranging words in a good way. I mean, that's part of it. And a good part of it, especially for someone who's like self-published or indie, you have to do so much. Like on my own marketing team, I have my own hype man, it's a lot of things. Versus like other professions where you just do a job, do it well, and, and move from there. Beyond that, properly do writing, you got to research. You're on the, uh, the writer's memes long enough. It's like, you know you're a writer when you Google how to stab someone with scissors and get away with it. You know, you know it's like the memes, shit writers, writers search. It's really crazy. It's like, how reason. long can a person live with their heart removed? You know, <laughs> stuff like that, you know? Like, <laughs> where it's like, please, FBI, please don't arrest me. I'm, I swear, I'm doing a novel. I'm not actually <laughs> doing anything, you know? What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? When I realized uh, I can say one word five different ways and have it mean five different things. Like, for example, hi. Hi. Hey, you get the idea. That language is more than just words. It's tone, inflection, 
how you say it, what you bring to the table, I mean, accents. There's like so many different ways to say the same thing. Like you can say one thing one way and be perfectly polite and say one thing another way and be perfectly rude, but you're essentially saying the same thing. And that's not even getting into like cultural or like personal preferences. Saying one thing that one person might perceive as perfectly fine, another person may be highly offended. You know, language is so infinitely complex. It's really a wonder we even have any grasp on it. You know, everyone always asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? <laughs> sorry, sorry. The first thing that came to mind was so fucking dirty. Uh, it's not writing. But it's just advice. <laughs> Always wear a condom. Oh, oh, and never stick your dick in crazy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like you said, writing, but my mind, mind instantly went there. Like it went to the gutter. I'm so sorry. So, you know, that is the first time someone has ever said that. So, yeah, you're first. Good, good job. <laughs> oh, I popped cherry. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, you wore a condom with writing then. Second wisest piece of advice. <laughs> the wisest one was your first draft is always going to suck. Deal with it. You know. That's probably the wisest piece of advice I ever gotten. Second wisest is you always, always, always have an editor. Check your work. So what's the hardest part about writing? The beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? I'd say the middle because starting a project is really fun. Ending a project is really fun. <laughs> when you're kind of in the doldrums, you're like kind of stuck in the middle of it, finding the motivation to keep on going, keep on a regular schedule and whatnot. That's really, really the tough part. You know, it's fun to start a project. And it's fun to end it. You know, when you're on those last few pages, you know, like that, that fury of like, I'm almost done. Sure, maybe you work for an hour, but like you're almost done. So you work for three hours because like you're almost done with that project. And so you, you do it off, you finish it. You feel like a million bucks. Middle part where there's no motivation either way, where you got to find your own motivation. That's really the tough part. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Rod Serling. He is, uh, for those who don't know, he's the writer and creator of The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a fan of his work. And honestly, his work has kind of made me look at storytelling in a different manner. He's really the kind of person who showed me really the power of the medium. You know, the way he uses typewriter at the time to really use a reader, you know, point him in a different direction, all the while kind of telling a concise message. I've always really appreciated his work and he's, I consider him to be my writing idol. From a professional standpoint, you have created multiple comics when it comes to, of course, 2100 Samurai and your current version of Screecher, which I can't wait to see in its final form there. Insert any Dragon Ball Z reference you want to hear. <laughs> Literally, when you said that, my, like, my like, the first thing I thought was... This isn't even my final form. <laughs> exactly. So literally, I was th I was thinking it. <laughs> so from a professional standpoint, you are successful. Plus, you know, you did well at, at your comic convention as well, too. Do you consider yourself personally successful? <sighs> it's really hard, hard to say. Successful in a general sense, kind of. Like, I will say I was successful in certain tasks. Like, obviously, today I was successful. I was successful at this convention. I was successful at selling. But do I consider myself a success, kind of in the general terms? The best way I could say is maybe not yet. Like, I feel like I'm definitely heading somewhere. Like, I feel like based off of how well I sell, I have a fuck ton of potential. And I feel like I'm onto something. Like, I feel like my comics are special. But I haven't, like, broken yet. I'm on the path. It's looking quite likely that I'll, I'll make it. Um, but I haven't gotten there yet. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I try to turn them into learning experiences. That way, the failure feels like it wasn't for nothing. If I learn from the failure and I use it to get better, at least it had a use. At least it had a purpose. Ultimately, I'm a better person for it. You know the phrase, failure is the greatest teacher. And that's just how I try to treat failure. Just viewing failure as like the, a fault of a person it's honestly self-defeating. It just kind of sends you on a dark cloud. Yeah, I fucked up. What can I learn from it? Don't do that in the future. Do this instead. It helps me get better. And at least that way, there was a purpose to it. 
the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or artist or someone creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would say be open, be cordial, because you are the greatest fan of your work. You are the ambassador to your passion. It's your job to share what you love with people. No creator is an island. Your creations, while they are your own, eventually next generation will come around and you need to help them succeed. You know, I mean, that's just kind of the nature. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, the title. Um, oh, the things we do for money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just coming off with a cup, off the cup here. But, you know, that, like, that would probably be the title of the things, of the, thing you, of the things we do for money. <laughs> And soundtrack would probably be early, early 2000s, a new wave revival or whatever that was. Like stuff like uh, Finger Eleven, The Strokes, you know, that kind of stuff. My theme song is Basket Case by Green Day. That's, that's, that's what I consider to be a person, you know. I got issues of the wazoo and it just that song just kind of describes me to a T. Well, you know, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, and, and thank you so much for coming on the show. I do greatly. I mean, it's just another turning point of sort of stuck in the road. Where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, uh, where can we find uh, this Screecher uh, campaign on Indiegogo as well? So to answer the uh, the last question, you can find uh, Screecher on Indiegogo. Uh, I'm sure there'll be kind of links somewhere, but if not, just go to Indiegogo, search Screecher. Uh, it should pull up. I'll be going live. The campaign will be going live October 7th. I hope to see you guys there. Hope to get your support, you know, buy a book or whatnot. And then you can find me on Twitter, Project Access. I'm also on YouTube, Search the Phoenix Press, um, and, uh, and lots of places. Feel free to drop me a line and tell me how much I suck. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word to, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, because I'm only one person, please give me a break, which is www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And we have a Patreon, so help support the channel any way you can, uh, because I've been doing this for 15 years, and I would like to keep the lights going, which is patreon.com forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. <laughs>